Hey everyone, welcome to this video all about Azure cost optimization. Uh, I wrote a blog article a couple of weeks ago and I said I'd create a video summarizing the key points and it's actually taken me a while to work out what was the best way to actually create that video. If it should be kind of whiteboarding or all PowerPoint, and I kind of settled for kind of something in the middle where I'll kind of walk through uh, the PowerPoint I create. And really it's all about these are challenging times, but even in the best of times, we don't want to waste money. Um, after all, um, we like money. We want to spend our money the right way. And so what I want to look at are the things we think about, the things we can optimize, how we can understand what we're spending uh, when we leverage Azure. And so we're going to walk through some of the cloud cost basics. Um, how do we get billed for things in the cloud? I want to look at viewing my spend, understanding accountability, because that's really a key thing. Many of us on premises remember kind of VM sprawl. Um, we had hypervisors, people created virtual machines, and we completely had no idea who owned a certain VM. So we could never delete it. Maybe it was running some mission critical process. Most likely it was doing nothing, but we couldn't risk it. We didn't know who used it. So we want to make sure we have good accountability in the cloud. Free stuff. Um, there is free stuff in Azure. And so we want to take advantage of the free stuff before we start paying for things. Helping with migration. We have existing workloads. We want to take them to the cloud. Um, what are the tools available to help me do that? And right sizing is critical. Again, often on premises, we would over provision. I don't want to take that to the cloud. So what can we do to understand what I actually need for a certain resource before I move it? Now we're going to carry on optimizing throughout the entire life of a resource. What can I do to right size it before I start the movement? A few benefits, reserved instances, a hybrid benefit. Again, helping me save money. Then optimizing certain services. Uh, compute, storage, databases, network, what are some of the things to consider? And then Azure Advisor is my friend. I actually want to talk a bit about Azure Advisor and, and just how we should be using that kind of constantly. There's a lot to cover, but I don't want this to be too long. And to me, these days, too long will be more than an hour. So I'm going to try to go through this pretty quick. Um, and I'll maybe try and link to other videos or answer questions in the comments below. Before we get started, if this is useful, please kind of give it a thumbs up. Uh, please subscribe, comment, etc. I want to make sure this is totally clear. Optimization is not something we do once. It's not something that we do at the start of the project and then we kind of walk away. It is an ongoing effort. Yes, before we deploy, before we architect, we think about these things, we learn what's available in Azure. Then we design our service, meeting the requirements in the most optimal way. Then when it's running, we might tune and tweak things. We stay up to date with all the services that are out there because maybe there's something new. Maybe there's a new option for the service we use. Maybe there's a completely new service that enables us to change. So this is an ongoing effort. This is not a one-time thing. And I'm going to repeat this a few times throughout this video. So cloud cost basics. Fundamentally in the cloud, it's consumption based. Um, I pay for what I use. Now on premises, we provision based on the future worst case scenario. I remember when I was a consultant and I'd be designing an exchange deployment. We would think about, well, how much mail do you think you're going to have in five years time if you grow this much, etc.? And that's what we would buy. That is the server we would purchase because it had to last that long. So whatever the worst or maybe best case scenario was in terms of how much we've grown, we would have to size accordingly. Now, virtual machines have helped with that, but still on premises, we tend to, to bloat. And on premises, we tend to scale up. If something gets busier, we make it bigger. We'll shut down the VM, we'll add more CPUs, we'll add more memory, then we start it back up again. So we scale upwards, we make things bigger. We don't think about that in the cloud, we want to scale out, but I'll kind of come back to that. 
So in this cloud, we can scale up. We can make things bigger, just like on-prem. We can add CPUs, we can have memory by restarting the virtual machine. But we prefer to scale out and in. It's a lot more dynamic. We think about having more instances of something. So we're going to scale out, scale in. And if I have five instances, we pay for five. If I have three, we pay for three. And that's kind of a better option. So let's kind of just think about those. So if I scale up, I make something bigger. So here I've got my, my little virtual machine is doing his job. I've got one virtual machine doing that job. Now, if I get busier, I've got more load, then yes, I can make a great big, powerful, bigger virtual machine. So the pro here is I'm increasing my scale. Absolutely. Um, I can process more. It's got more CPU, more memory, maybe more IOPS, more capacity. I can do more. So I can take more requests. So I'm meeting the requirement in terms of scale. But on the downside, my cons, well, it likely requires a restart to do that resize operation. There are also limits to how much resource like a single instance of an app will normally be able to take. There's an upper limit of how many CPUs, of how much memory, of how much IOPS the app can actually make useful use of. It's also doing nothing for my resiliency. This great big powerful guy gets sick. If he has to have maintenance and restart, my entire service is down. So yes, I'm increasing my scale, but I'm not increasing my resiliency. Whereas in the cloud, I want to scale horizontally. We've got this same guy, but now my workload is increasing. So here I can add more instances. So I'm paying for more instances in the same way I was paying for that bigger virtual machine before. If my workload decreases, well, I can shut some of them down. So the pro here is I'm still getting that increased scale. Uh, as I need to, I add more instances, I increase the scale. But I'm also increasing the redundancy, the resiliency of my service, because now I have two, three, four spread over different racks, maybe different data centers through availability zones. Maybe I'm even scaling across multiple regions. I'm active active. So not only am I increasing scale, I'm increasing my resiliency. And that's really kind of an important point. There's no downtime. I'm not adding CPU or memory to a single instance, which requires it to restart. I'm just increasing the number of instances. They might then go under a load balancer, which will then start sending requests to them. So it's very dynamic. I'm, I'm only paying for what I need, and it's zero downtime. Now the cons are, well, I might require a load balancer, depending on the, the architecture, and I might have to pay for that. If I wanted the standard load balancer across availability zones, there's a, there's a charge for that. My app may have to be tweaked. Today, my application might be kind of single instance. It doesn't work with multiple instances. So I may have to actually tweak my application to work multi-instance. But it's something that's worth doing. This is definitely the future. So in the cloud, this is the winner. I want to scale out. I really want that capability and that, that's key. When I start thinking about cloud workloads, if I think that single instance, yes, I can run it. I can put it on a premium SSD. I can still get an SLA, a 3.9's SLA. But where I start getting the, the higher SLAs, where I start getting zero downtime, zero downtime maintenance, uh, if there's an unplanned failure, I'm still up and running because I'm resilient to a rack or even data center failure, I need more than one instance. So I definitely want to be thinking that direction. It's going to give me that ability to dynamically scale. Now, when I think about planning for costs, there are often several ways to meet requirements. So I've got some requirement. Make sure I understand all of the options I could use from a compute, from a storage, from a networking perspective. Make sure I understand high availability requirements, disaster recovery requirements, retention requirements. I need to understand all of these things to help me craft the right service. And maybe there's a, a SaaS offering out there that can just do this thing. So think about the business requirements first, then I think about putting those into technical requirements, and I think about an architecture. 
understand the various cost components for any part of the solution. Again, when I architect in the cloud, I'm probably bringing together multiple things. So understand the options across all of those different components, and then we kind of bring them together to create the service. If I want to understand what something's going to cost me, there's an Azure pricing calculator. This lets me go in and say, well, I'm going to use this component. I have this many running for this many hours or this much capacity or this much IOPS. Um, I can plan in different types of cost saving things like reserved instances, like hybrid benefit, um, like maybe a discount I have as an organization. I can export this out as a CSV file. So this is a good thing. If I want to understand what my pricing is going to be, uh, I do this. I go and look at the pricing calculator. Make sure you don't forget about things like backup and disaster recovery and monitoring is huge. If it's IaaS, what's it going to cost me to patch the OS, to patch the runtime, to monitor it? Is the OS healthy? Is the app healthy? Um, I need to have insight into all of those different things. If it's a database, I have to tune it. Are my indexes healthy? Um, are my partitions correct? Am I sharding it the right way? It's all work I have to do. Is that stuff I'm doing on my own? Or is there maybe some intelligence to help me with those things? HADR costs I talked about. And then there's the service management. So the thing is I'm doing to manage underlying layers, maybe like runtimes and middleware. And when I start going into platform as a service offerings, I'm managing a lot less than if it's an IaaS. So IaaS will be a virtual machine. With a virtual machine, I'm worrying about the operating system, the runtime, any middleware I have on that. And I'm worried about the app and the data. If it's platform as a service, I'm just worried about the app and the data. That's kind of a key point. In the cloud, we never really worry about the physical fabric. I'll often draw kind of the layers, but the compute, the storage, the networking, the hypervisor, I don't care about those things. That's Azure's responsibility. The lowest level I care about is the operating system and the tasks associated with that operating system. And there's lots more. I mean, there's many other things when I think about costs. The point I want to get across here, though, you make sure you consider the complete solution. Yes, the Azure pricing is a big part of that, but realize there's other costs as well. There's humans to go and manage these various components. There might be licenses for software you use for patching or for backup or whatever that might be. So that's why if I can get to sort of PaaS and SaaS offerings, it's not just the components, the whole pricing model shifts completely. So I'm now not worried about the operating system. I might not even worry about runtimes and middlewares anymore. There's a lot less for me to focus on. And really as a business, I care about the app. The app provides the business value. Very rarely does an operating system or a runtime provide business value. As a company, we want to care about what differentiates us as an organization from our competitors, and that's going to be our app investments. So the more I can focus on that and let someone else worry about the stuff that makes it run, the better. So viewing my Azure spend. Um, Azure cost management is phenomenal. It's really evolved after the last year. There was an acquisition, a lot of the functionality has been moved into Azure cost management. So it gives me a number of cost analysis capabilities. Um, now the primary one is this cost analysis capability. That's gonna give me insight into the cost across my subscriptions, different resource groups. Um, I can add filters, maybe based on the type of service, the region tag. Tag's huge, you're gonna hear me talk about tags a few times, this key value metadata I can apply to my resources. Um, different date ranges, different types of view, I can really pivot all around and dive into the data. So if I'm just curious about, hey look, what have I spent? And maybe where's the trend going? The Azure cost analysis capability is phenomenal. So we definitely wanna go and take a look at that. Go into your subscription, go and look at the cost management, and just have a look around, familiarize yourself with the capabilities, with the kind of dive into the data I can do with the different filters and the groupings. It makes it easy for me to quickly see, well, okay, I'm spending this amount of money. Why am I spending this amount of money? What am I spending it on? 
Again, I can, I can drill into that uh, data to find out the root of the costs. It's also billing API. So I can write my own stuff to go and pull that usage data and maybe even pull it into a different analysis tool. There are actually things like Power BI tools I can leverage to go and do my own analysis of the data. Now, if I'm an enterprise customer, so I've got an enterprise agreement, um, I can actually obtain an API key. So that API key then lets me pull all the enterprise level data. Again, so I could do my own analysis, um, maybe relate to the entire enrollment. So this is great to go and see, well, what am I spending? Uh, I've spent this money, I'm trending a certain way. Um, why? What was it on? I can also do budgets. And budgets are great because budgets let me actually control maybe but they let me maybe set actions at certain thresholds of a budget now most commonly that budget is going to be um, dollar based but i also can use metrics and i can do it at different scopes so i could set a budget for example at a management group at a resource group at a subscription and then what i can do is yes i can set the budget to say hey your budget is one thousand dollars you might have heard of action groups. So action groups are this common um, technology throughout Azure. Um, we originally saw them with kind of alerting. So in Azure Monitor, I can have alerts. Hey, my CPU has crossed a certain threshold. Um, call this action group. And just like the name suggests, an action group has a number of actions tied into it. That could be send an email, it could be send an SMS message, it could be call this web hook, which calls some restful process. It could be raise a service ticket. I can use the same action groups as part of my budget thresholds. So I could say, hey, look, when I hit 70% of my budget, call this action group. Maybe that action group just goes and sends an email to the owner of whatever scope, be it a resource group, a subscription, a management group, a set. It says, hey, you're at 80%. Um, here's a report of what you've spent so far. Maybe at 90%, it sends it in a bolder font in red. Say, hey, stop, stop spending me money. 100%, it sends a web hook to some service ticketing system. Uh, it sends this big burly security guard to go and like bop them on the head with saying, say, stop spending money. Um, whatever that might be. We simply don't like to auto shut down things. If this is a production service and it's spending more, it might be because business is great. We have lots of people using our service. I don't want to go and shut it down. Test dev, maybe. Um, production, probably not. But I still want to know. I want to make sure there's not some huge unplanned bill at the end of the month. So we can do various types of communication, notifications, escalations, whatever is right for our service. But budgets let me do that. All these different action group actions to do different things. So I can call those action groups, uh, those thresholds, and again, be careful about just stopping stuff. Free stuff. Everyone likes things for free. Now, in Azure, there are a number of aspects that are free. Now, there are also others that give you a certain amount free, and then I start paying for it. Now, I'm going to just cover a few of them pretty quickly here. Some of my favorites is the right word. Um, but there are many others. You should go and look at the documentation and that will actually go through all of the things you get free. And I'm not talking about a free account. I can go and sign up for like a, a 12 month getting started and I get certain services for free for that year or maybe I get certain dollar credit. These are things that are kind of always free. And also, if I have MSDN, you get a certain amount of Azure credit as part of your MSDN, use that. It's your personal sandbox where you can go and learn. So Azure policy is free. Azure policy is how I'm going to think about applying guardrails to my environment. Things like DevOps and the new process we use to deploy. I don't have someone manually looking at requests and doing the deployment and checking. So policy gives me those guardrails. Azure Active Directory is the core identity for everything. There's a free SKU. Cost management and budgets are free. Network ingress, so stuff coming into Azure is free. AKS cluster management is free. There's basic security information with more and more being rolled into them, including identity recommendations, are free. Or based access control, resource group, management groups are free. Azure Advisor is free. And there's many other things. 
I get five gigabytes of network egress, and then I pay for the rest. I can do one million function executions, and I use this to run like PowerShell in the cloud. It doesn't cost me anything. I can pick one Cosmos DB account per subscription to have this kind of initial free tier of 400 request units per second. If I go beyond 400, I pay for what goes above that. 10 app services for free. 50,000 B2C authentications. That's how I can think about if I have a customer facing app. I don't pay for the user accounts anymore. I just pay for the authentications. I pay for the MFA interactions. Well, 50,000 just regular authentications, I get free. So go and kind of check out the documentation. I'm linking it to it in the kind of YouTube description. Go and see all of those different things. So let's talk about the, the more common. So, okay, so I've got past the free stuff um, I'm using my resources. What can I do to optimize that cost? So Azure reservations, they used to be called reserved instances. That's when it was just CPUs. Now it's moved beyond that. There are other types of services I could do this reservation for. And I kind of think about this as, imagine you're pre-booking a hotel. Um, if I just show up at the hotel and say, hey, I want two nights, I pay a certain amount of money because the hotel um, is having to kind of react to that it has to expect certain rooms to be empty, so it has to upcharge the normal rooms to make sure it's meeting its bills, it can still make a profit. Whereas if I know, hey, I'm gonna be there for two months and I pre-book it, I get a cheaper rate. And the, the further I book that for, three months, six months, I get a cheaper and cheaper rate. Now it may be for a couple of those two, three nights out of that three months, I'm not gonna be in that hotel room. Maybe I'm popping home or something on a long business trip, but it's still cheaper to just reserve that room for three months. It's really the same idea for the Azure reservations. So what I'm gonna do is many types of Azure resource I can pre-commit for a one or three year term. Now obviously I'm gonna get a, a bigger discount if I do three years compared to one year. And I, I get pretty big discounts on this thing. The exact discount varies, but it, it, it's a big number. Now, many types of service can be reserved. So it's not just compute. There are things around Cosmos and storage, different types of resource. So I'm committing, hey, I'm gonna use this for the next one year or for the next three years. So I'm gonna pay less money for it. Now you have to balance this um, because again, if I'm not using it, I'm still paying for it. I pre-booked that room for three years. If I'm not in that room for a couple of weeks, I'm still paying for it. So when I think about resources, I would use the reserved instances if I know I'm gonna need that. That's kind of my, my base level. I'm always gonna need that amount of resource for the next three years. I might need more resource, but maybe for those bursting amounts, remember I'm scaling horizontally, that I'll pay the regular rate for it's not economical to pay that reserved instance price because it would be not used for too much time. So there's a balancing act and you can, you can tweak these um, as you kind of go on. Now for compute, originally I had to buy it for a certain size. So I'd buy an exact skew of virtual machine. Now it's based around a VM group. So I buy cores of a certain group, for example, DB3. And I could break that up into ones with two virtual CPUs or eight virtual CPUs. I just pay for a hundred reserved instances for three years of DB3. And then in total, I can use a hundred virtual CPU cores of that type. I don't have to do anything. This is a billing mechanism. Essentially, this billing engine wakes up each hour, looks at my reserved instances. Oh, you've got a hundred DB3 virtual CPUs. What's running right now? The first hundred I find, I'm going to apply that discount to. That, that's all it is. It's not named instances. It's totally flexible. It's just going to look at, well, how can I use that? Every hour it's going to wake up and do that for you. And when it wakes up, it is just a billing engine. So I don't have to do anything. So as an example, this is like I've got four apps. And they're all V3s just in this instance, uh, D2s, D2, D3. 
you can see, hey, and in this case, I just bought two cores. So this is a two core virtual machine. I have two reserved instance cores. This is not very real, I have more than that, but let's just for the sake of simplicity. So in this case, I can see, well, app one is running when it's a darker color, it's running. So the billing engine wakes up and applies that discount to my first app. Well, in hour four, a second app starts, but I only own two cores of reserved instance, so it can't apply it to the second application. Well, then the first app shuts down, then it's gonna apply that reserved instance price to the second app. Then nothing's running, but I'm still paying for that reserved instance core for that hour. Then app three wakes up, then app four wakes up, and you can see the reserved instance just applies wherever it can. So, so all this is, I think about what is my base workload, or maybe even a bit more than my base, if it still works out cheaper, even if it's not running for 10% of the time. If the discount was 50%, that's still worth it. So I, I think about that math when I think about what is the right reserved instance for me. Now you can switch between VM groups. There is a mechanism to do that switch. So, hey, I don't wanna use DV3 anymore. I'm switching over to E series or something else. There is a mechanism to do that. Um, I can um, stop early if I need to, but there is a penalty. So obviously I was getting a discount based on a certain period of time. So there's a, a penalty I have to pay if I want to kind of cancel early. But if I know I have a certain base usage, the reserved instance makes a, a huge amount of sense. Um, especially when I think about it, if I can do that three year, I get a huge saving on that. But even one year, I still will get big savings. And you can go and look at the pricing and it shows you in the pricing calculator what the percentage savings will be for reserved instances. So next we think about hybrid benefit. Now the point of hybrid benefit is, well, I've got on-premises licenses today, I've got software assurance, and it's gonna let me take that license and leverage it in Azure. Now if it's Windows Server, if it's standard, for every two processor or 16 core license, I can basically use that Windows license on two eight core or one 16 core instance. Now it could be a smaller instance, like a four core, but listed only two instances. I couldn't do eight one cores, for example. Two eight cores or smaller, or one 16 core. So I'm taking that license and instead of using it on-prem, I'm gonna use it in the cloud. Now if I have data center, well, it's the same as above in terms of processor to, and core mapping, but it's simultaneous. I can still use the license on-prem and use it in the cloud. So then basically what that means is for my Windows virtual machines, I pay pretty much the same as a Linux virtual machine. I'm not paying for the uh, Windows license cost anymore. For SQL Server, there's standard cores. I buy a SQL Server or enterprise cores. So basically what I get is one cloud core for standard for every one on-premises core, and that maps to kind of general purpose or hyperscale or SQL standard in ISVM. If it's an enterprise core, then I get four cloud cores for one on-premises core if it's general purpose hyperscale, or I get one cloud core if it's business critical or SQL enterprise and ISVM. But that's not simultaneous, I can't still use it on-prem. I'm moving that to Azure. So now I can get that kind of for a cheaper thing. And the key point here is Azure reservations um, love hybrid benefit. You put those two things together and it, it's crazy kind of the discount I can get on my Azure resources. So if you, if you can, um, take advantage of that. Let's think about migrating. So I have existing workloads and now I'm thinking about moving them to the cloud. Make sure you really understand the true requirements. Um, how many times I've gone and looked at an application and it's deployed a certain way and you ask people why, and they go, because it was like that when we got here. People don't understand the business requirements, the technical requirements. Take some time to understand that. Take some time to understand how it actually runs. What is the performance of that application? Um, are there peak times? Are those peak times hourly, daily, monthly, annually? For data, clean it up. 
before the migration. I may have a whole bunch of data. I really don't need any more. It's there because I really can't be bothered to do anything with it. Do I want to not only pay for it in the cloud, because in the cloud I pay for consumption. I pay for the storage I'm using. But remember, I have to get this into the cloud. So that's going to be, Ingress is free. It's not that it's costing me money, but it's going to cost me time. And depending on the type of data, does the system have to be down while I'm copying it from on-premises into the cloud? If that's the case, the neater, the smaller the data, the better that's going to be for me. So if I can, let's try and clean up the data before I think about actually pushing that into the cloud. Now there's Azure Migrate. Azure Migrate is a, a tool you can leverage. It's going to help me with that assessment. It will actually go and look at the resources, um, look at the configuration, work out would it actually be compatible with the cloud. It will go and look at its execution, what resources it's actually using, work out dependencies. Again, when I start moving things to the cloud, it's no good moving half of it to the cloud and leaving half of it on premises um, if it's chatty. My performance, the latency between saying on-prem and the cloud, even if I have a fantastic express route connection, is going to be a multitude bigger than if it's sitting in the same data center. The same data center, um, same data center sub millisecond most likely. Data center Azure maybe it's twenty milliseconds. It depends. It's going to be a much bigger latency. So if I took the database tier and moved it to the cloud and left the app on-prem, probably may not work very well. It may be fine, but you need to understand that. I have to understand the dependencies. And likewise, from a dependency, what does it need to function? I don't want to take a cloud service and then have a dependency on saying on-prem. Now, if on-prem fails or my network connection fails, the cloud service doesn't run anymore. Understand all those components, because ideally, I kind of want it to be able to run. If I move it from on-prem to the cloud, I don't want to rely on something on-prem because then I'm very dependent uh, on that on-prem, I'm dependent on the network connection. And there are tools to actually help me migrate the data, both for VMs, I can use Azure Site Recovery to replicate and then fail over. Um, for databases, there are tools to help me migrate to Azure SQL Database, there's a lot of cool stuff to help me with that. Accountability and governance. I mentioned before VM sprawl. Um, so many companies struggled with VM sprawl. Um, hey, we have this hypervisor. We don't have to buy a service for project anymore. It's really easy to create VMs. Maybe we had cloud on-prem. Everyone created virtual machines. Um, but there wasn't, it wasn't a true cloud. I wasn't tracking who owned things. And so all these VMs sprung up, servers filled up. So we had to buy a new server and a new server and another SAN. And we had no clue who owned what, but we didn't know what they did, so we couldn't shut them down. We don't want to get into that state. So it is critical that every resource we have in Azure has an identifiable origin. Who created it? For what app? For what project? For what cost center? I want to be able to track that for every resource so then I can go to someone, to some project, to some cost center. Maybe I'm not doing chargeback, but I still want to know what the cost center, what the business line is using, what they're costing the company. Make them accountable for that to show what business value, hey look, you're spending $2,000 a month in Azure. What is the business value we're getting from this? So I have to be able to have that accountability. Now a logical structure, when I think about management groups and subscriptions and resource groups, it's going to help hugely with that. So we want to make sure before I start deploying anything in Azure, we get governance first. We get identity set up, we get governance set up. Governance in terms of management group and subscription and resource group structure, um, in terms of role-based access control, in terms of policies. So I'm putting that core scaffolding in place to enforce my governance, where I can have public IPs, what regions I can use, what resiliency I need, budgets, how much I can spend, but accountability as well. I want to be able to track who is using, who created these resources. Tagging is our friend. Tagging are key value pairs. Cost center, cost center number. Creator, date created, 
whatever that might be, use tags. And the cool thing is, I can use Azure Policy, remember that was free, that was one of our free things, I can use Azure Policy to require certain tags to be present or the creation of the resource will fail. See, if I'm using a, an Azure DevOps pipeline or an GitHub Actions, it won't let it get created unless I've got these tags in place. Or, uh, tags are not inherited from the parent resource group. Every resource lives in a resource group. I can put tags on resource groups. I can put tags on subscriptions, tags on uh, everything, management groups. But I can use Azure Policy to say, look, if this policy, if this tag is not present, copy the value from the resource group and put it on this resource for the tag. So I can essentially inherit from my resource group via Azure Policy. And tags are great for that identification. They're great for searching. I can go and quickly find things. From a billing perspective, I can pivot on tag. So I can see, well, what is this tag, this particular app, this particular project, what is it costing me? And I can quickly go and find out, well, who created that thing? Make sure you're assigning Azure policy at the right scope. When I think about policy, remember I can do things like have that core scaffolding. Hey, uh, I can't create public IPs in, except for these subnets. Um, I can't use the more expensive SKUs. Um, I must have GRS replication on my storage account. If it's Tev debt, if it's dev test, I probably don't care about GRS. If it's prod, I probably do want to use the more expensive virtual machines. Um, so, so make sure at the top levels of management group structure, we'll be more broad in our governance and really capture the key things we must do. As we get closer down, closer to resources, we'll get more specific. So make sure when we think about policy and all of those things, we do it at the right scope. And just as a kind of Super quick reminder of that thing. When I think about resource organization, remember we have Azure Active Directory, we have our tenant, we have our root management group, then we can have a whole hierarchy of management groups underneath that. Then we have subscriptions under the management groups, then we have resource groups in our subscription, and then we have resources in the resource groups. That, that's our structure. And we have policy, role-based access control, and we have budgets, I can apply to all of them, any management group and they get inherited, subscription, they get inherited, resource group, they get inherited. And yes, I can also do it to resources. We don't wanna do that. We should not be assigning our back, for example, directly to resources. Now, yes, we can, we should be doing that. Automations might do our back at a resource level. Us as humans, resource group is the lowest we should ever be going. Um, Resource groups bring together components that share a common life cycle. They're getting created together, they're running together, they're deprovisioning together, so probably we'll want common permissions, uh, common policy, common budget. We don't need to go any lower than that. But yes, technically I can do RBAC at a resource level. This was all setting things up. And these are all critical for cost management. I have to know all these things. And again, when you think about policy, policy could help me stop spending. If I make sure I don't use those big VMs, um, I'm gonna save money. If they make sure I have a certain budget, it's gonna help me control my spend. But I do need to deploy stuff. Now, when I think about optimizing my service use, um, I, I have to obviously think about, well, how do I actually do that in my environment? So I wanna look at some considerations across a range of services. Now, for everything, any requirement, if there's a SaaS option, generally that's fantastic, we'll try and do that. Um, the further I go from IaaS to PaaS to SaaS, the less I'm responsible for, the less kind of human costs I'm gonna have to run those things, the less tooling I'm gonna require, generally it will save me money. But I can't do that for everything. I'm doing a custom app, I probably can't do SaaS. But for compute, we're gonna try and push as far to kind of the PaaS as we can. So we have virtual machines, that, that's IaaS, that's a virtual machine, individual resources. We have virtual machine scale sets. Hey, a certain amount of automation deploying them based on some template. I can do containers, then containers of orchestration with AKS. I have app service plans and I have serverless. 
So I'd be trying to go as far that away as I can. If I can use serverless, phenomenal. Let's use serverless. If I can't use serverless, can I do app service plans or AKS with containers? If I can't, well, okay, well, can I do VM scale sets? And then if I can't, sure, I'll do a VM. I love VMs, I'm an infrastructure person. But I'm still gonna try and push the other way as I can, because it's less for me to manage. I'm not patching operating systems or middlewares, worry about antivirus or firewalls or runtimes. I wanna minimize that stuff. I wanna focus on the app that's bringing value to the organization. And for databases, it's kind of the same thing. Yes, I can install at any database I want in an IaaS virtual machine. But if I can use Azure SQL Database, great. It's an evergreen service. It's got some certain amounts of high availability and backup and optional DR just built in. I'm not worrying about upgrading SQL versions. I'm not going to get some technical debt that I have today on premises because I'm running a 20, 20, 10 year old version of SQL Server. If it's an open source version, um, maybe it's Postgres, maybe it's MySQL. Well, there's a, an Azure managed version of that, uh, MariaDB as well. It's going to do those minor updates for me. It's got a certain amount of backup built in for me. So if I can use that, that's better than me just deploying my own to an IaaS virtual machine. Uh, if it's NoSQL, it's Cosmos DB. So always make sure you understand what's there. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm trying to go as far away from me installing sync in a VM as I can. I said at the start, I'm saying it again, it's midway through. Optimization is not a one-time activity. We're optimizing constantly. We're designing, when we're deploying, when it's running, we're, we're constantly re-evaluating. Okay, for all my workloads, be it compute, storage, network, I have to understand the usage pattern. I have to understand the kind of the average run rate. I have to understand the peaks. Uh, the duration of those peaks, the frequency of those peaks. Is it a 30 minute window every day? Uh, domain controllers, boot storm. Is it a five hour window? Uh, one Sunday a year. I'm a pizza restaurant and it's Super Bowl. Is it a few days of the year? Uh, maybe I'm a retailer. It's um, Black Friday. Uh, I'm a, a telco and the new iPhone is coming out. Maybe it's a couple of months. I'm a, I'm a tax prep shop and it's leading up to tax day. Understand what they are. Because that's really important because when I'm sizing, I don't want to just always have running for that worst case scenario, but I need to make sure I consider it in my architecture so I can burst up as I need to. And depending on the frequency, um, uh, what that at peak is, I might architect that burst in different ways. Because for example, I talked about kind of scaling out, and that's great, but for a domain controller, do I want to add four domain controllers for half an hour and then delete them again? Probably not. Is there maybe another way I can burst for a 30 minute window? So virtual machines. Uh, there are a huge range of virtual machines types and sizes. Uh, there are ones around memory optimized, um, compute optimized, storage optimized, ones with GPUs, ones with high performance computing, with RDMA network connections. Take time to understand what your workload is more skewed towards. Is it skewed towards storage or CPU or memory? Is it more just general? And then find the, the tier, the type that is the best fit. And what's the right size? Number of CPUs, memory, IOPS, throughput, number of data disks I can attach, network throughput. Look at all of those things and, and we pick the one that's the closest match to the model we have, all the different types of resource. Now, some of them do have bursting capabilities. The B series can burst the CPU, just like a cell phone plan where I can roll over my minutes. The B series, I get a certain percentage um, with the CPU, maybe it's 10%. If I use less than 10%, I can start accruing credit. I can then burst. If I've accrued credit and I need to exceed the regular 10%, I can go up to 100% based on the amount of credit I've accrued. So in that domain controller, where I have a 30 minute storm a day, but normally I'm pretty idle, fantastic. Uh, I don't need more domain controllers, I'll just burst up at those times. The LSV2 
now supports uncached bursting around IOPS and megabytes per second. The same idea, it gets a certain amount of IOPS and throughput. And then if I'm using less than that, I can start banking credit for IOPS and throughput. And then I can burst up if I actually need to. So I can use more than that for up to, I think, something like 30 minutes. So I can far exceed what I actually have. Premium SSDs P20 and smaller, I can burst the performance of those as well. So it has a certain steady state, but I can burst beyond that. And all of these things are designed to say, look, instead of buying a bigger VM or a bigger disk, for some fairly rare burst, hey, look, we'll, we'll, we'll let you have the burst. Um, Azure Files Premium, I can burst the performance there as well. So look at what is my requirement, what is the steady state, what is my burst. There might be other ways to solve that. Now, I can scale up. I can change the type. Uh, I can change the size. It's going to be a restart. I can't dynamically add procs or memory. Even if it let me at the VM level, there are very few applications that will go and recognize you've added CPU or memory and do something useful with it. So if I resize, it's going to be a restart. That's why we prefer to scale in and out. Uh, it's dynamic. Um, and it increases that resiliency as well. Remember, even for virtual machines, I really want at least two. Yes, I can do one, and I get my 99, my three nines SLA, but ideally we want two spread over either an availability set, i.e. different racks in the same data center, or availability zones, um, different data centers in the same region. And then maybe I need, I need DR as well. Remember to shut them down. So yes, size them correctly, optimize my spend. But shut them down when you're not using it. And when I say shut down, I mean deprovision it. I'm going into the portal and shutting it down. I'm using um, REST APIs or PowerShell module or the AZ CLI. I'm not doing a shutdown in the guest operating system. If I do a uh, start shutdown, it's still running. From an Azure compute perspective, it's still provisioned on the fabric. I'm still paying for the compute. I need to deprovision it from the fabric, and then I stop paying for the compute. I still pay for the storage. It can't delete the storage, I'd lose my state. But I can stop paying for the compute aspect of the virtual machines. And there's an auto shutdown capability for virtual machines. It uses dev test labs behind the scenes. So I can say, hey, at six o'clock, this is my dev environment, shut it down every night. I could write an Azure automation. I could write an Azure function and uh, have a schedule trigger to shut down my workloads at weekends and at night when I know I don't need them. I could be mindful and say, hey, I'm done with this. I'm going to shut that thing down. If I do create a bunch of workloads and it's a test, make sure you delete them when you've finished. Um, put, put test workloads in their own resource group. Again, that the function together. So I just delete the resource group when I'm done with that test. Save me money. Then make sure you do delete everything. For virtual machine, there's the virtual machine. Duh. I'm paying for that. It's dollars. I have the OS disk, I'm paying for that. I have data disks, maybe I'd be paying for those. I don't pay for the network adapter. Maybe it's got a public IP address. Uh, I'm paying for that, most likely. Um, I get a cheaper price for I think the first five in the ARM model, but then I pay a bit more. In classic, we got five for free, we don't in ARM. So I'm, I'm paying for more than just the OS. If I just delete the OS, but leave the disks behind, if they were like a premium SSD, I'm still paying quite a lot of money. Clean those things up. Use good naming. Um, this is what I know is I don't like the portal. With the portal, it auto names stuff, and I may be able to work out what's associated with what. If we use templates, I name everything. So I have a good naming standard as part of my governance. Uh, maybe it contains the, the region, the, the use. The, there's, there's all guidance around these things. But maybe I've got a consistent start to all of my naming of all my resources that's the VM. And then it's data disk one or public IP or NIC, etc. So I can easily associate what belongs to what resource. So I don't have things left around. Make sure everything gets deleted when I'm done. Don't pay for stuff that's doing me no benefit. Now there's a little bit of help. I wrote a script, I posted it to GitHub that will go and search for unused disks, either they're not mapped to a VM. It will go and search for public IPs that aren't used. Also, 
Azure resource graph is much faster than my script. Um, it's almost near instant. It will search across all your subscriptions as does my script. This will go and find any disks that aren't mapped to a virtual machine. This will go and find any public IP address that is not mapped to a virtual machine. Now, caveat for this one, my script will also go and check is it mapped to some kind of NAT gateway, something else, a load, but something. This doesn't do that. So just be super careful. It's not being used by something else before you try to delete it. These will help me go and find resources that aren't in use. So just a, a little bit of help there. Virtual machine scale sets, so we're, we're taking another step. This provides a managed deployment and scaling capability. Now, I have a gold image. This could be a marketplace image, or it could be a custom image. It's one I've created. And what's gonna happen is, I have a configuration that says, hey, how many instances I want, a base, and how many it can have when it bursts out. Um, I can have scale actions based on schedules based on metrics. Hey, CPU is above this amount. I can then use extensions to add configuration. So rather than having this highly customized image with my app and everything in it, try and keep the image as standard as possible. And then I use things like, maybe it's um, DSC, Chef, Puppet, whatever that might be to inject configuration Ansible into the guest OS. So some kind of declarative technology that says make it look this way. So now I can take that base image and make it my application. It's gonna inject my application into it. And there's a huge benefit here because now virtual machine scale sets, I can actually configure it so that if the image it's based on changes, gets a new version, even from the marketplace or custom, it will automatically redeploy the VMSS Never more than 20% at a time, so it's a rolling update using update domains, and it will just now be using that new image. So not patching these things. Hey, a new image comes out, the latest patches on it, phenomenal. I don't have to do anything. You know, just get done. And then it'll be running from the new base image. So I specify those minimum, maximum, and scaling triggers. Um, I can also use spot instances. Now spot instances, think about the hotel analogy for a second. Um, I talked about if I pre-book, I get a cheaper rate because it helps them plan. In the same way, if I just show up at the hotel and it's last minute actually, they may have a bunch of empty rooms they're desperate to get rid of and they're trying to compete with other hotels. They're going to give it to you cheaper. They say, okay, look, um, yep, you can have this room, but be aware that if someone else rolls up in his Rolls Royce and offers me full rate, I'm gonna kick you out the room. Go, sure, I'll stay in the room as long as I can for 10 bucks a night, I'll take that. So Azure Spot instances are the same idea. Azure will have spare capacity. It will vary by the type of VM, could be D, could be E, it will vary by region. And so to help kind of clear this spare capacity, they'll offer spot pricing. Now that pricing will vary depending on how much they have spare, depending on the region. So I can say, hey, look, I want to use those spots and I can use it for regular VMs. I can use it for virtual machine scale sets. I can use it for Azure Batch. And I'll say, yeah, I want to use your spot pricing. I'll pay up to this amount. Okay. So then I get much, much cheaper compute, but I may get kicked out with a few seconds notice essentially by someone who then comes along and wants to pay the full price. So this can be super useful. If I have workloads that maybe aren't sort of time critical, I need to get this work done, but I want to get it as cheaply as possible, I can use those spot instances. So my batch, my VM, my VM scale sets. Now I can't mix spot and regular pricing in one VM scale set. So I would have one VM scale set regular, uh, one VM scale set using spot, but I can still have a load balancer to kind of point to both of them. So take a look at Spot. If I have workloads, I just need to get stuff done. But uh, how quickly it gets done, I'm kind of flexible on that. It's when it's done cheaply. And Spot is going to be a very cost-effective way to do that. If I have stateless instances, so there are no unique special snowflake I care about, maybe I can use ephemeral OS disks. So ordinarily, we have 
ROS discs on Azure Storage. Managed disc, there's three copies of it, it's highly durable. With the ephemeral OS disk, the disk actually lives on the host that's running the compute. If it gets deprovisioned, if the host fails, I lose it. But if it, it's not stateful, if it's not special, it's just duplicating a gold image, I may not care. If anything stateful is stored on some separate storage, maybe it's Azure Files, Azure NetApp Files, maybe it's a shared managed disk, and maybe it's Blob. And I'm using BlobFuse to make that available to me, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I don't care if it goes away. I've got lots of instances over different zones and scale sets, whatever. Yeah, I'll save some money so I'm not paying for the OS disk anymore. All I'm doing is using the storage that's actually on the host. Now, I kind of alluded to kind of the snowflake and the pets and the cattle. We are used to pets. Um, we're used to, these are my pets. Uh, it's Ollie and Eddie. Uh, we name them, we take care of them, we feed them. If they're unwell, we make sure they get healed. Um, that's our regular workloads we're used to on-prem, our domain controllers, and we're always gonna have a certain number of pets. But where possible, we wanna get to cattle. Um, uh, if it's sick, we just stand another one up in its place. I'm not particularly naming them. I'm not, if it's sick, I'm not gonna spend a lot of money curing it. There's no attachment there. That's what we want our compute workloads to be. We want to get to cattle. And I think it's Jeffrey Snowbird that said, and when we talk about things like containers, they're chickens, they're not even cattle. They're just running around. Um, I don't want some unique, special thing about any workload if I can help it. I want to be able to take, hey, I've got some base image and I've got some declarative configuration and it makes it that service and makes it that app. That's a much better scenario for me. So VM scale sets are getting to that point. So gold image, now I stamp out copies of it. They're cattle. Now, even with VM scale sets, there might be some that are pets. I can do things like about, well, deprovision in this order. Don't delete that one. So there are some special things I can do. Now, as we start moving into things like containers, they're getting more and more cattle-like. So the point of containers, well, they're often how we start thinking about PaaS en masse. We're virtualizing the operating system. Virtual machines virtualize the hardware, virtual CPUs, memory, NIC, storage. With a container, we're virtualizing the operating system. Lots of containers run under some shared kernel. So virtualizing the operating system, now we still have controls. We have isolated namespaces for process and network stack. We have resource controls to make sure we don't steal from our neighbor in terms of CPU, etc. But We are using this shared kernel. But orchestration is key, just containers on their own is really not that useful. I need to think about high availability of the containers. I have to think about, well, load balancing. I have to think about health and remediation, um, resource control, monitoring, network, storage integration, uh, balancing my workloads. There's a lot of considerations for containers that on their own they, they don't have. I need an orchestration solution. Kubernetes one. Um, there are multiple orchestration solutions. Um, but Kubernetes has become the standard. Azure Kubernetes Service, AKS, provides a free control plane for Kubernetes. So absolutely, I could deploy Kubernetes into other containers. Um, virtual machines, I could stand up all of those components. But why? I'm just paying for stuff that I don't need. The API server, the scheduler, the etcd database. That's all provided on a per tenant managed isolated instance for me by Azure with AKS. I'm not paying anything for that control plane. I just pay for the worker nodes. So use AKS. Don't manually install Kubernetes that you're then managing, that you're paying for those components to run that control plane. AKS gives me that for free. I just pay for the workers. Now, additionally, um, yes, we have the pods that deploy to those worker nodes, I can auto scale those nodes. I can add and remove nodes from my AKS environment based on the workload that's running. Again, optimizing my cost. I pay for the worker nodes. If I'm not using them, I don't need them. Well, let's shut them down. Stop paying for them. I can also hook into Azure Container Instances. Azure Container Instances are really containers as a service. 
Um, and the way it works is there's a virtual kubelet. The kubelet is how the control plane of Kubernetes talks to the workers and tells them what to do. Hey, deploy this pod. So the virtual kubelet makes ACI look like an infinite scale node. So now AKS can talk to ACI to deploy instances. So maybe I have some big burst. I can use ACI for that. App service plans. So now we're moving further. This was one of the original services. And when Azure started, it was like app services. Now there are various types of plan available. Um, they have different features and different limits. So make sure you understand your requirements. Like if I look at the, the features just super quickly, you can see there's like a free. So there's, when I talk about there's free things, there's free, there's shared, there's basic. When I get to standard, you can see it talks about auto scale. So standard and premium and ace, I say, I get into auto scale. It talks about how many instances I can have. So standard 10, um, premium 30. When I get into the isolated IN app service environment, I can go up to 100. So we have different scale capabilities, but even when I deploy these, the instances have different sizes, numbers of cores, amount of memory, amount of storage, and I pay accordingly. So make sure we understand what are my requirements what plan is right based on maybe features I need. Um, and then again, I can scale the instances I have available to me. So, so I can scale up and out. So I can actually make change the series and size and there's almost no downtime. It's really cool. I'd actually go and vision new plan for me of the new size. Once that's stood up and my apps are hydrated onto it, then it just flips it over. So it's almost like zero downtime. I have auto scale with standard and above. I can deploy multiple apps to an app service plan. And depending on the plan, I might have deployment slots. So I can have like prod, I can have staging and then switch them to make a very transparent um, uh, deployment pattern. They're sharing the same compute nodes. It's not a different set of nodes per app. It's not a different set of nodes per deployment slot, they are shared. So when I have to scale the plan, I'm scaling all the apps, all the deployment slots. Just important to understand they are sharing that plan and the scale. Then there's the app service environment. That gives me a dedicated instance that's deployed into my virtual network, no shared components. I have high limits. I can do web apps, both Windows and Linux. Uh, I can do mobile apps, Docker containers, and functions. Now obviously that costs more because it's all dedicated. App service plans, there are certain components that are shared across tenants. Um, ACE is all dedicated, all to me, all in my VNet. So obviously I have to pay a little bit more because there's more to it. Then we get into serverless. This is kind of the utopia and I think about efficiency of cost. So Azure Functions provide a serverless execution for many types of apps. I can run C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, Python, PowerShell, there's others. This is how I run my PowerShell now. I'm an info person, uh, but I run my PowerShell now through an Azure function. Now, I can actually use an app service plan, if I have one, to run my function. So I've got existing resources, I could run it in there. Or I can run it in a pure serverless mode, where I just pay based on the resource I consume. CPU, um, storage going in and out. I trigger based on a schedule, based on a webhook, based on some other event. I can use event grid. Hey, look, someone sticks a blob somewhere. Event grid can fire and fire my function. I go and grab the blob. I run um, AI against it to find out what's in the blob. And then I have bindings that I could bind to more things coming in. So maybe the event grid was my trigger that the blob had been there. The storage account is also a binding that I can read the blob. Then my output binding might be to a Cosmos DB to write, hey, this blob, this had this car in it or this human in it, whatever that might be. I have logic apps. Logic apps let me use kind of a graphical architecture via connectors. Um, I pull in from this connector, maybe it's a LinkedIn message. I then go and link into this other service for sentiment analysis um, and then go and again, send something outbound, some alert, some message, whatever it might be. But I create these connectors and I architect it by this visual flow to bring all those things together. 
I just pay based on the connectors and the actions I use. I just paying for the stuff I do. Moving on, and I'm kind of above my hour already, as I knew I would be. Um, Azure Storage. For example, there's different types of storage account. Now, for Blob, I have different tiers. I have Hot, Call, Archive. As I go from Hot to Call to Archive, I pay less for the capacity, but I pay more for the transactions. The idea is if I move to Call, I'm expecting to use it a lot less, so I want to pay less money to store it. But then if I do interact with it, I'm going to pay more money. Archive is not even available in real time. I have to bring it out of Archive into Call. It's kind of a fetching uh, fee associated with that to move it back. Use lifecycle management. Lifecycle management lets me apply rules to say, hey, look, if this data has not been used for 30 days, move it from hot to call. If it's older than a year, delete it. And combinations of those things. Again, optimize my cost. Let lifecycle management help me spend less money. Blob and files have performance tiers. The greater the performance, the greater the cost, but it might be required. I might need higher performance. I'm willing to spend the money. Pick my resiliency based on the requirements. I can have a minimum, there's always three copies. That's LRS, three copies in a particular stack, particular data center. ZRS, there's three copies within my region, but now spread over data centers. GRS, three copies in one data center in my primary region, three copies in a paired region. GZRS, three copies in my primary spread over three data centers, replicated to three copies in the paired region. And then there might be read access variants of those GRS and GZRS. Obviously, I pay more. So I move up from LRS to ZRS to GRS to GZRS, I pay more money. But I get better resiliency. But what is my requirement? Don't pay for resiliency I don't need. If my app is running in two regions and it is replicating data itself to a local copy, why am I bothering to make the data resilient as well? Understand my requirements, architect accordingly. Maybe I only need ZRS. If I have a lot of on-premises data, maybe in file shares, um, actually using Azure Files might save me money. So Azure File Sync lets me replicate um, from file shares into Azure Files, a share in Azure. And not only does it store it in Azure Files, I can use tiering to say, hey, this stuff on-prem, maybe I've got an expensive SAN that's running out of space. The stuff I'm not using on-prem will tear it out to the cloud. So now it's stored in Azure Files, but not in my on-prem SAN anymore, saving me money and adding resilience. Something goes wrong, and with the new AD integration for Azure Files, I can actually access it and have the ACLs enforced in Azure. For managed disks, the capacity and the performance scale pretty linearly. The bigger the disk, the better for the performance. Pick the disk that makes sense based on the capacity requirements that makes sense on the scale I need. And that it might be, hey, I don't need a very big disk, but I need some high performance. So I have to pick a bigger disk. Um, Ultra actually lets me scale those dimensions separately. I have my throughput, my IOPS, my capacity, three different dimensions. I pay for each of those separate dimensions. If I actually look at the pricing page, you actually see normally, we kind of get, hey, look, there's a disk size, we get a capacity, we get IOPS, and it goes up linearly. If I look at Ultra, the pricing is very different. Hey, look, I pay a certain amount for IOPS, a certain amount for throughput, and a certain amount for the actual capacity. So capacity, IOPS, throughput. So I could have a one terabyte disk doing 160,000 IOPS. I can change it dynamically, so I can actually use REST API to programmatically change my IOPS for a nightly batch job and then drop it back down again so I pay less money. So make sure you understand all the options that are available when you're kind of sizing these things to make sure I'm not spending more than I actually need. Also remember, both compute resources and storage resources have their own limits. 
they need to be architected together to meet the performance requirements you have. And what I mean by that, imagine I took, for example, um, a P60 disc, a premium SSD. That can do 16,000 IOPS. Phenomenal. And now, imagine I connected those to a D4 V3. That can do 6,400 64, IOPS. That's nowhere close to 16,000 IOPS. So I'm just wasting performance. I'm not going to get what I need. I need a bigger VM to take advantage of the IOPS available to that disk. So make sure if you're not seeing the throughput you think you should be getting, well, maybe I need a bigger VM. Maybe my VM's too big or maybe my disk is too big. Understand the different dimensions and architect accordingly. Don't pay for more performance than I actually can do anything with. I'm just kind of wasting money. Databases. Use PaaS if I can. If there's a PaaS database option, it's going to be generally better and cheaper than the IaaS. Um, I'll give you an example of this. Um, it's actually, I think about, for example, Postgres. Um, I've been playing around with this for some of my customers, and I did a cost analysis. And using the Azure database for Postgres gives me the same SLA, four nines, as running Postgres in IaaS VMs split over AZs, but it's only 70% of the cost. Now you might say, how can that possibly be? A lot of the PaaS data services use, it's not regular containers, but it's in that type of containerization technology that they can spin up in seconds. And so they don't have to run two instances running in kind of an active passive configuration to switch over. They can just run one compute instance with the data separate. If it died or it has to be updated in some way, they just flip over to another one created within seconds. So it's actually cheaper to run the managed offering just in pure terms of Azure costs than running it in an ISVM. And I get seven days of backup included. And I'm now not paying um, the same amount of sort of DBA costs for someone to look after this thing and do minor updates. It just happens for me automatically. So if there's a managed offering, a PaaS offering for my database, generally it's going to be a, a better bang for my buck. Now I may have certain scenarios, I have some super custom thing and I, and I, I can't do that. Totally get it. But just make sure you understand what the options are. Um, Azure SQL Database, there's numerous tiers and sizes. I, if I go to the, the V core instead of the DTU, the database transaction unit, which blends compute and storage together, if I go to the V core model, then I pay separately for the compute and the storage. There's even a serverless option for Azure SQL Database. I can pause the compute and just pay for the storage. Just like uh, Azure Synapse, what was Azure Data Warehouse? I can pause the compute. For Synapse, I can pause the compute. I just pay for the storage. There's things like hyperscale. There's all these different options to each one optimize my costs. Azure Cosmos DB is actually a challenging one. And it's challenging because they, they use request units. And it's not that it's flawed, it's that it can be a little bit of a, a dark art to work out what are the number of request units I need. And so you need to really take time. Now, good news is there's now an auto scale option. It used to be called autopilot, now it's auto scale. Because you used to have to just do provisioned RUs. You had to have a guess, I'm gonna need this many, I'd provision that many, and then I'd go and look for 429 error messages, which means, hey, you've been throttled. Or I'd monitor and say, hey, I've got way more than I'm actually using. Now with auto scale, it will adjust the RUs up to a maximum I set to meet my requirements. But that's only half the picture of Cosmos. Like any database, um, it, it's partitions. There's lots of instances that partition my data. So I have to pick how I partition my data by partition key. I'm sharding my data. I need to make sure I shard it the right way. I, I partition it logically so that when I run operations against it, ideally as fewer partitions as possible can answer that request because then it's gonna use less request units, i.e. less money. If I run a query, an operation, it has to go against every single partition, it's gonna cost me a lot of request units. If I have architected my data, my partitions, to meet how I run operations, and a 
an operation can run against a single partition, it's really going to optimize my cost. It's why with Cosmos DB, you'll actually see some people will duplicate the data. Uh, the data is cheap comparatively to store the data. So they actually duplicate data using different partition keys and they use the change feed in Cosmos DB to trigger that data duplication based on different ways I want to interact with the data. Key point here is you have to tune your operations, make sure you're looking at how you're using request units. That's how you optimize your spend with Cosmos DB. But definitely auto scale helps hugely, but you really do need to pay attention to how I'm partitioning the data, how my operations run against those partitions to, to get the best bang for my buck. And just finally, super quick, network data. Remember, you pay for egress from a region. Data's going out of Azure, I pay for. There are exceptions. Express route local is a type of circuit where I can only connect to the near region. So if I created an express route circuit in San Antonio, I can only talk to the San Antonio region. Um, Azure Backup doesn't charge you for egress when you're restoring. But for everything else, you pay for egress. So think about that egress traffic when I'm architecting my services. If I peer networks together, then there's an ingress and egress charge for the data that flows between them. I pay for gateways, be it a site site VPN gateway or an express route gateway. I pay for gateways. So consider those different charges and costs when I think about my network architecture. It might be cheaper and probably more efficient to have a hub network with my express route gateway and then use peering from the hub with um, tr uh, transit to let them use the remote gateway and they flow through that single express route gateway rather than giving every network their own express route gateway and there's limits anyway but realize there were costs there were costs for peering there's a bigger cost for global vnet peering but i pay for gateways as well so you want to weigh all those different things as part of those costs for internet facing services it's egress obviously but services like front door can cache data and they can accelerate it split TCP. The, the connection for the end user is kind of terminated at some edge location. It goes on the Azure backbone to get to my service. So that might help optimize as caching services available. Again, think of that in my overall architecture. Finally, um, and if you take nothing else away, which is why I've saved this for last, there are many ways to continue your optimization journey. It's ongoing. Azure Advisor brings that best practice guidance around many aspects, uh, performance, operational excellence, high availability, security, and cost. And it's that bit we're going to focus on. So Azure Advisor continually evaluates the resources you have deployed and their use. It will then, after a period of evaluation, make recommendations. Some of those will be, hey, this SQL database is too big. Um, you should right size it. You have unused public IPs. You have unprovisioned express route circuits, uh, unused VPN gateways. And there's a whole list of them you can go and see. But pay attention to those things. I remember I had a customer who brought it up in a session and it was like potential savings $70,000 a year. Okay, I should, I should probably go and do some of those things. So look at this weekly. Just go and look at Azure Advisor. And I can actually plumb this into things like um, uh, actions. So I can create alerts based on the recommendations that can fire an action group, which could email me. So I can actually trigger, I can use resource graph to look at these things. So there's different ways to look at these recommendations. But definitely, definitely look at them. No, this is not gonna give me architectural guidance. This is not gonna say, hey, I have using my super smart AI, said you should move this to a PaaS service, or it's not going to that level. So this is a step, it's not the only step. You should still be thinking about other options that may be available to me. So in conclusion, covered a lot of stuff, well, it's nearly an hour and a half video, I apologize. Um, there's lots of considerations. Hopefully you kind of saw that. You can go look at maybe the blog article to get kind of a quicker summary of some of this stuff. It is an ongoing effort. Yes, before we migrate, before we deploy, we think about this. While it's running, we continue to think about this. Stay current. 
things change. Um, yes, I've done a deployment, but stay up to date on what's happening in Azure. Maybe there's a new service tier. Maybe there's a new burst capability. Maybe there's a completely new service, and I should think about re-architecting. Maybe I can move. Maybe finally I can move from that IaaS based database to a managed one. They've added some new feature that now meets the requirement that it didn't meet before. Be willing to question architecture choices and assumptions. Again, never assume the person that maybe came before you did the right thing. Um, they may have inherited it from someone else who at the time just really was tired and just said, oh, let's do this. Um, often we might deploy things. It's better to do something uh, maybe that's not optimal than just spend forever stuck in an analysis paralysis. And then they, they left and no one ever came back and did that step. So it's okay to look at what's there and maybe question it. What were the assumptions? Were they valid? Are they valid now? What were the requirements then? Has the business requirement changed? Have things evolved? So we maybe should be doing something different now. So it's okay to go and question those things. Now, understand, when we do that and we want to maybe modernize our app, we want to change something, well, that will probably cost money. It's going to be developer time, project management time. But overall, that may cost X dollars, but over a one year or two year or three year period, if now we're optimizing the services in Azure, it will overall save us money. So that you always have to kind of take that balancing act. If you take away nothing else, look at Azure Advisor once a week. If, if you only do that, you're still better off than a lot of people and it will point out some, some pretty big things to you. But hopefully you understand some of the, the different things going on, the considerations. I put out an Azure update every couple of weeks about the new features. Um, watch that, and it'll keep you up to date a bit. This was super long. Uh, thank you for your attention. If it was useful, please like, subscribe, comment, share. And uh, until next time, take care of your money and uh, stay safe.